So today's lecture is going to be a little bit different um, than some of the lectures that we do in here. Um, it's uh, going to be one where you, you might have a little bit harder time taking notes, um, but I do want to talk through a very common type of machine element that is included in many, many, many kind of machines, uh, and it is what is called a journal bearing. So journal bearings uh, rely on there being some type of lubrication in between two round parts that are interfacing with one another. And to get us started kind of looking at some of you know, practical uh, you know, examples of this type of a bearing, um, I have the example shown up here, several examples shown of what is often known as the rotating assembly that is in automotive engines. Okay, So I want to kind of talk through some of these pieces and, and how they work. Um, so you know, what, what happens inside of an engine is that there is a crankshaft. The crankshaft's job is to take uh, gas pressure that's inside of a cylinder where there's a piston that creates a moving boundary, basically, that allows there to be an expansion of gas. And then that expansion is actually that energy from that expansion is put into what's called a connecting rod, uh, which connects the piston uh, to the crankshaft. So a lot of you are already familiar with this idea, but I figure I'd kind of talk through it a little bit as, by way of background. Um, well, in the process of doing this, you have this relatively massive, um, you know, rotating assembly in the crankshaft. Okay, so this little guy right over here is the crankshaft. Um, that crankshaft uh, also has to carry pretty high loads. So whenever you have a combustion event inside of the cylinder and it causes the gas to expand, it puts uh, very large amounts of force into the connecting rod, and that force then has to be uh, transmitted into the uh, crankshaft in some way. And uh, that, that force is not only high amount, it's actually very suddenly applied, right? Because you have this combustion event that happens very quickly. This is actually not a good application for rolling element bearings, typically, because what happens is, since you have these really high peak loads, uh, in this, it, it actually can create a situation where the uh, rolling elements might locally, right at the point they are, whenever that load occurs, it can cause more deformation than you want in the rolling element bearings. And so it's a really good application here of using another kind of bearing. The uh, kind of the most technical term I could use for this kind of bearing would be a hydrodynamic bearing. And the goal with a hydrodynamic bearing is to get there to be some sort of liquid in between, or I should say maybe more generally fluid. It's not unheard of to actually have examples of um, hydrodynamic bearings that use gas as the, as the bearing. Um, I don't have a great example for that other than a, um, if some of you play, have played air hockey. You ever played air hockey? Okay, that's an example of a hydrodynamic bearing, all right? Because you basically have suspended the disc in the air hockey above the uh, surface of the table, and it's not really even making contact. So it's just levitated on this cushion of air, and it'll slide around on that cushion of air. It doesn't mean that there is zero friction, because that it will actually lose speed over time. You've played air hockey, right? And whenever you hit the disc, it, it slows down. But uh, didn't mean to get off too far on that side of things. But the idea here is that when you were using a hydrodynamic bearing, you are suspending parts one away from the other so that there is no actual contact between the parts that look like they are going to contact, okay? And so with this type of a rotating assembly, um, I'll kind of draw your attention um, over here. This, this thing over here is the, an actual picture of an engine block down on the, uh, these are all called main bearings right here. These are the bearings that uh, actually allow this crankshaft to rotate. And so those main bearings would uh, be applied on these, you know, main bearing locations. There's another one over there on that side. And it holds this crankshaft all where it needs to be. Now, one of the things that you are going to see um, whenever we get into this a little bit further, you are going to see that there are actually very, very, very close clearances between the, uh, the different parts, right? So uh, it's kind of interesting that you can make this engine block that might be a couple of feet long 
and you need to make sure all of these uh, you know, bearings are perfectly aligned or else you're not going to be able to have those clearances because your clearances are going to be on the order of you know, a thousandth of an inch or so. All right, so you have to get all of those things aligned and you know, that seems kind of impossible and yet just about every one of you drive a car that has this piece of equipment in it, right? And they somehow do that reliably. So pretty cool. Uh, once you set the, uh, the crankshaft in there, you actually, uh, you, you kind of fix it in place by putting these um, you know, bearing caps over and you'll notice that they actually put these little inserts in there. Why do you think uh, those inserts are included in, a, uh, in an application like this? Okay, if they are a slightly different kind of material. Do you think they might be hard or do you think they might be soft? Okay, someone says soft and that's, a, that's really good intuition that is usually not uh, what most people say. Most people would say, no, you want that to be hard so that it lasts a long time. Let me put it this way. Whenever you have these parts, one rotating in another, um, you, you hope that they don't ever actually touch each other, right? You want there to be a fluid film in between those two parts so that they don't actually touch each other. So it's not super important that both sides really be hard necessarily. What they usually do is they make the journals, that's what these little areas are where the, the uh, contact would occur, they make these journals so that they are extremely hard and they are extremely polished. That's on the crankshaft side. On the other side, this material is often made out of stuff that's a good bit softer. And not only that, they, they use a soft material so that in case there are any contaminants in the oil that is going to be between these parts, the, uh, the side that is softer actually has the capability of literally absorbing those contaminants and it embeds it themselves inside of that soft material so that it doesn't stick up because if it sticks up then that creates something that could start abrading the polished surface of the uh, of the journal so these are all kind of interesting things they um, they make these little bearings that sit in there uh, one of the most common failures that happens whenever someone doesn't do maintenance on their car they sometimes run out of oil what do you think happens then Okay, you stop having oil in between these surfaces, and then what? It gets hot, right? Because it's not made to have that metal on metal contact. Once it gets hot enough, what do you think happens then? Okay, one of the things that can tend to kind of happen is that the bearing insert can essentially weld itself to the surface of the uh, crankshaft. And once it does that, it'll do something that's called spinning a bearing. So it'll actually spin that bearing in the, the seat that it has there in the engine block, and it can ruin the crankshaft and the engine block if, it, if that kind of thing happens. So it's extremely important that you don't let it run out of oil. Um, the, one of the other things that I'll mention about this is that the uh, journal bearings that are used in the engine of your car, uh, unless you have some kind of a very strange car, they use what's called forced lubrication. So what do you think that means? Okay, yeah, there's, a, there's an oil pump somewhere in the system that takes oil and intentionally introduces it into the bearings where it's needed, all right? And you actually see this right here. There's a lubrication hole that's all built into the engine case. That's basically a pressurized tube that's in the engine case, pressurizes oil through a little hole in the actual bearing insert, and that introduces oil into the region that needs it, all right? One of the other things that you see very frequently on these bearings is that they will include a groove on the inside like this. What do you think that's for? Yeah, it helps to distribute the oil all the way around and gives it, you know, the, it makes it less possible that there's going to be some region of the bearing that ends up without oil, right? So it's a, a nice little technique that they use there. Not only are there these bearings on the mains, there's also, there needs to be bearings on what are called the connecting rods. So you see here there's a, an assembly that happens for this connecting rod um, and, you know, that holds these inserts into those connecting rods as well. They, they basically experience the same uh, angular speed as the mains, right, because you have to have relative motion between the crank and the, uh, and the connecting rod. 
Okay, so those are all pretty cool things. Um, where else do we have contact that we have to lubricate? Okay, there's this other part up here that's called the wrist pin. All right, that's basically the connection between the piston and the connecting rod. That also has to stay lubricated or else, you know, for the same reason, it will uh, cause there to be metal on metal contact and that we don't want that. So one of the things that you see on these, it's kind of hard to see uh, on this picture, but you see little holes up in the top of that, that rod. What happens there is as the engine runs, uh, oil is thrown everywhere off of this crankshaft as it's, as it's spinning. And some of that oil is slung up to the top and drips down into these wrist pins and keeps those lubricated. All right. Why do you think I'm sharing all this? What do you, what do you think? What are my reasons for kind of describing these things? Yeah, well, I don't want you to destroy your engine. That's true. But a lot of you will end up in careers where you are going to be in charge of making sure that machines don't destroy themselves, right? And that one of the biggest things that happens in, in many, many, many um, mechanical machines is that they need to be lubricated. And, it, you know, when you're using oil as lubrication, when you have these hydrodynamic bearings, it's extremely important that you understand how that lubrication strategy is happening because you can very easily make a change in something and, and uh, you cease to get lubrication where you need it. What if I was to all of a sudden make one of these connecting rods and not include that hole up there in the top? Well, you'd probably decrease the chances that you're going to actually get the amount of oil into that, um, you know, into that interface that you need and you might end up seizing two pieces of material together and there's always this not always, but there's very often a uh, chain reaction that happens after one part fails. It causes another part to fail, which may end up leaving some loose piece of debris in the engine that's spinning or running or whatever, which might get thrown into something else and break something else. Many, many failures begin with bad lubrication. And so that's where I'm, you know, I'm just trying to give you one example of where this can occur. Um, Oh, another thing I wanted to mention here is something that a lot of people, you know, when I, when I learned this, this is an amazing thing. Um, in order to lubricate the, uh, the crank bearings in an, in an engine like this, they actually have the ability to drill. There's actually a hole that is drilled from, you might see this little hole right here. There is a hole that's drilled in the crankshaft that goes back into one of these main uh, journals. And so that pressurized oil that you're introducing into that main journal, journal is actually delivered through that hole out to the journal that, that uh, houses the, the uh, connecting rod. So that's pretty sophisticated. Like, you know, to actually make something like a crankshaft isn't cheap uh, because that's, you know, those are some, some uh, complicated drilling procedures that you have to get in order to end up with those passages to let that oil go out to those, um, those spots. So, all right, any questions? I mean, this stuff's really cool to me. I hoped I, you know, could share some of that with you. What you got? Okay, for all of these, so like for these main bearings, the insert is fixed into the block, right? So for these pieces right here, I know it's kind of hard for me to gesture to them, but for these pieces right here, those are not allowed to turn. And one of the things that keeps them from turning, um, it's going to be hard to really see, but you might see right there, there's a little tab right there. And when you install the other half, like you, you install the bearing cap uh, into this position right here, that bearing cap actually has a surface against which that tab bears, and it keeps it from rotating. Okay. Now, there is going to be a journal like this crank, these crank journals. Those are going to rest against these surfaces and rotate relative to those surfaces. Okay, so that's uh, the basic idea of how these, these things work. So um, as far as the, the uh, connecting rods, these are the little inserts that get put into the connecting rods, and those inserts don't rotate relative to the connecting rod but the crankshaft rotates relative to the insert. 
OK, so the question is, with uh, rolling element bearings, you basically use the balls so that you have this rolling um, interface between the parts, and that greatly reduces the amount of friction you have. The question is, how do you reduce friction in this case? Well, the, the friction is actually reduced in these cases because the parts aren't touching each other. Okay? The, because you have this oil film in between the parts, that oil film prevents the parts from actually touching one another. And because they don't actually touch one another, it reduces the amount of friction. It actually changes it from being, you know, kind of a dry friction between two dry things. And what kind of friction do you think you end up with? Okay, it's a little bit more of a viscous friction, right? Because you actually, the friction you have goes into shearing the fluid that you have in between the surfaces. And that, you know, it, it gives rise to an increase in the temperature of the lubricant because that lubricant is being sheared. And so it, it uh, generates this temperature rise. And then that's why many of your vehicles will have an oil cooler, right? The oil cooler is there to try to reduce the amount of, of heat that's stored in those lubricants. So pretty interesting stuff. Any other questions before I move into kind of the little bit of theory that we're going to do today? All right. Let me give you actually a little bit of more history. Um, bearings like this have been used for a long time. Bearings like this have actually been used for a lot longer time than people even understood why they worked. So people have known that you can introduce oil between two circular surfaces that are mating with each other and that that reduces friction and makes them last a lot longer. And, you know, so people have been doing this for a long time. Back in the late 1800s, there's this guy, his name was Beauchamp Tower. He was a, you know, British guy. And he was trying to do some experiments. He, uh, he was working for the, uh, for the railroad. He was trying to do some experiments with these bearings like this and figure out stuff like, you know, just how much um, coefficient of friction do you end up with whenever you have parts that made in this way and such. So he did an interesting experiment that he discovered something he wasn't even trying to discover. Um, he set up a journal like this. So this is like one of those polished um, surfaces that I talked about just a second ago. And that polished surface, um, he put a load on it like this direction. Okay. And then he, you know, the other load is, is kind of seen up here with this W, right? So there's, there's these two parts that are being pushed together. And then he allows the, uh, the middle part there to rotate. The middle part is also sitting in a bath of lubricant. So that what happens is it would draw lubricant up from down here and it would bring it up into this mating surface between these two parts. So it sits there and spins. And I believe what he was trying to figure out was that coefficient of friction. Because you know, the question he was trying to answer for the railroad is, can we make a more efficient bearing? Okay. Well, here's what's interesting. Um, for some reason or another, after running this experiment such that this whole top piece was just one solid piece, he wound up drilling this hole in the top of the, uh, in the top part of this. And I think his goal was that he was going to start dripping lubricant into the hole and see if he could introduce lubricant uh, through the hole like this. But he still had it in the bath down here. And so when it was in the bath and he started running this, what do you think happened? OK. Lubricant squirted up out of this hole. We thought that's kind of strange. So he took a cork. And he stuffed it in the hole. And he said, I'm going to keep that lubricant from coming out of there. So he ran it again, and it popped the cork out. So he thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, I don't wonder why that happened. So he took a more rigid piece of wood, like a dowel, and he drove it in the hole, saying, that'll, that'll keep it from coming out. And he ran it again, and it pushed the dowel out. And he began to realize that one of the things that happens with these bearings is the mere action of the bearing rotating creates pressure in between the surfaces uh, that are involved in that mate. Okay, so it actually generates fluid pressure in this process. And uh, that is going to be kind of one of the main assumptions that we deal with whenever we uh, start working on, you know, more official problems that have to do with these um, hydrodynamic bearings.
and that's what we're going to get to when we meet next time. So, uh, but I wanted to go ahead and say that, you know, the kind of a bigger point out of this and a, a little bit of a philosophical point is that one of the things that happens in the world is that we start using things before we understand them, right? We start using them and then we kind of figure out how they really work. And this is an example of where that occurred. All right, let's actually do a, uh, I don't do a lot of derivations in this class, but I'm going to do one today because, you know, and, and it's a, a kind of a weird one for me to do. I'm going to derive an equation called Petroff's equation. I'm, I'm going to do this because it does give a, a few, it, it gives a way of describing a few of the parameters that we use whenever we're doing these hydrodynamic bearings. The thing that's weird about doing this is that Petroff's equation is actually not an appropriate equation to use for any practical cases, okay? Um, it was an early attempt at understanding, you know, how these hydrodynamic bearings work, and in the process of deriving it, it provided the kind of a little bit of light that was shed on some dimensionless parameter groups. Um, and so that's the point of doing this. We are going to see next time how we can actually do real uh, analysis of real hydrodynamic bearings. We don't use Petroff's equation for that, but Petroff's equation is a nice stepping stone to get from you know, knowing nothing about it to the point where we understand some of the dimensionless groups that are used in actual hydrodynamic bearing uh, design and analysis. All right, so here's where we start. Um, we have a journal that is rotating inside of the, uh, you know, the bearing, which, you know, sometimes that's called a bushing because it's basically just a hole, right? It's a cylindrical hole. And we have this journal that's rotating in here, and at least as far as these two, you know, examples relate to one another, this journal is rotating in this counterclockwise direction like this, okay? And for a lot of this analysis that we are doing, uh, the speeds, whenever we have an angular speed, we are going to use a letter N. And why we're not using a letter omega is that uh, the way most of this stuff was originally set up is where your angular speeds are given in revolutions per time rather than radians per time. And so we use a different letter for that. Uh, N is the is what's used in the book, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna match that with what I'm doing here. So N is angular speed. Okay, so that's our angular speed, and uh, as that angular speed is applied to the journal, what happens is uh, lubricant that was originally in between the journal and the bushing, so kind of all of this is oil in here, right? It's some kind of lubricant in between the two parts. So that little annular space is filled up with oil. Um, as we begin to rotate this, that oil begins to shear, okay? And if you have a, uh, well, I'll say that this equation right here applies to any time you have uh, relative velocities within a fluid, right? If you can find the derivative of the velocity of one kind of particle of fluid relative to the, you know, moving a direction y, right? So this y direction right here, that derivative right there multiplied by the viscosity of the fluid gives you the amount of shearing stress, okay? If this is a Newtonian fluid, then uh, what happens with this is that that relationship maintains linearity, okay? So um, where we see that, you know, each of these little bits of fluid like this one right here, essentially has zero velocity. This one up here has a velocity of u, right? And there's a linear relationship as you move away from this, the side that's not moving, right, down here, because the bushing in this example is not moving. So the fluid right next to that surface is not moving. The fluid right next to the surface of the journal is moving the speed of the journal. And then you have this linear uh, relationship for all of the speeds moving back toward the journal, okay? So far, so good? Does that make sense? All right, so, you know, since that, that's our, now our starting point is that this is the relationship for, for shearing stress. Well, one of the things we can do if that relationship between you, um, the, the velocity and the height is linear, we can actually extend that across the entire uh, height of the whole thing. So we can say that the shear is just going to be equal to my viscosity, all right, mu, 
uh, times okay, u over h. Now, that's this h right here. I'm actually going to, instead of using the parameter of h, let me actually change this to c. Okay, and there's a reason why I'm doing this. I'm not going to use h right there. I'm going to use c instead. The reason I'm doing this is that um, what we are really talking about as far as the distance between the journal and the bushing, that is something that we know as a radial clearance. Okay, means that the radius value of the, or the, of the bushing is that much bigger. It's c bigger than the radius of the uh, actual journal that is sitting inside of that bushing. Okay, so I'm going to call that the radial clearance. Okay, and because that's a linear relationship, we can just take this, you know, the amount of velocity at the top relative, you know, at the, of the journal relative to the bushing and divide by that total radial clearance, and that gives us our amount of shearing stress. Okay, now, what if I multiply this by the radius of the journal? So both sides of the expression I multiply by the radius of the journal. Is that allowed? Okay. So far, so good. So I'm multiplying the shearing stress by that uh, radius of the journal as well as the expression on the right side by the radius of that journal. Okay, the other thing I can do is I can express this, uh, this shearing stress tau in terms of a couple of things. I can, well, I can express it in terms of the amount of force that is being applied up here over the amount of area over which um, you know, this stress is distributed. Well, how do I figure that out? Okay, so here's the thing. The stress is actually occurring all around the entire perimeter of the journal, right? So that stress is occurring all the way around the perimeter and the stress is occurring all the way down the length of the bushing, however, however far that is. So like down here, you see this little letter L, that's referring to the length uh, of the bushing where it sits on the journal, right? So the amount of force that I'm applying here is distributed over all of that area. It's like you're taking that ring and you're flattening it out and you're saying, I need the whole circumference um, you know, multiplied by the length of the journal. Okay, yeah, if, I think his question is basically this, if, if you had installed something like a groove in here, like this, you know, the question is, would you count that groove? Um, you know, whether or not you could neglect that groove would be a function of how wide the groove was, right? So, if that groove was fairly deep and fairly wide, then you would probably say, I'm going to eliminate that from consideration. The other thing you can do is that that groove is not large relative to the rest of it. You can kind of pretend like it's not there and it probably won't throw your answers off too significantly. So, but it's a, that's a good observation. All right. So F over A uh, times the radius is now equal to viscosity times the velocity that I have there over C times R. All right. Well, what are some things you might be able to observe that we can do uh, with this? Okay. Let's actually start with area. All right. What is that area? We've talked about it. Let's go ahead and put it in as a function or as, a, as an expression. Okay. How much area are we talking about there? So the circumference would be 2 pi r. And then we're going to multiply that by what? L. OK. Now, what do you think f times r is? OK. Let me give you an idea of what f is, right? f is basically the amount of torque. It's, you think of there being a torque that is driving this journal. That torque would, you know, in order to drive this journal, it would have to be turning this way. Well, there's a 
tangential force on the surface of the journal that reacts against that because of the friction in the, in the uh, lubricant, right? And so where I have that torque applying in the middle of the journal, you know, it's creating this distributed force all the way around the perimeter of this journal like this. That's the force that I'm talking about. Well, how does the torque that I put in the middle relate to this distributed force that acts all the way around the outside edge of this thing? Okay, it's um, F times R is going to be equal to T. So F is essentially this distributed force all the way around the perimeter. Okay, so what that leaves me with here is T is equal to my viscosity of my fluid. All right, now um, we can probably um, restate a few other things here. Uh, one of the other things we can restate perhaps is this U, and I, I didn't talk about this yet, but the U value I have up here is basically a linear velocity, okay? And that's because we're focusing in on here. If I was really gonna draw this really accurately, I would actually say that this surface right here is curved, right? And this surface right here was curved. But if you get small enough, you can ignore those curves. You can kind of pretend like all that velocity is just linear, okay? And that's what we're doing here is we're making this very, very small. These radial clearances are typically super, super small. And so we, uh, you know, we're gonna kind of pretend like we can ignore those curves, which means that the journal velocity is linear. Well, how do I relate that to angular speed up here? Okay. Can I do it through circumference again? So if the angular speed, let's say the angular speed is in something like RPM, revolutions per minute. Well, what if I take revolutions per minute, which is what this angle, if you have the letter N there, it's a clue to you that says we're probably going to be measuring that in something like, like uh, revolutions per minute, revolutions per time, right? Um, well, if you're measuring it in revolutions per time, um, then what do you do to get that into an actual speed, a linear speed? Right, 2 pi rn. Okay, so 2 pi rn over c times r. Okay. Now what I'm going to do here is collect all of the other terms and express it in terms of the amount of torque that has to be applied to this bearing to overcome the friction that's in the lubricant, right? And when I do that, it ends up giving me 4 pi squared uh, r cubed uh, L times the viscosity times the speed all over the radial clearance. Okay, and that's all by itself kind of interesting, but what if I'm trying to do a similar thing to what Beauchamp Tower was looking for, and I want to say what I really want out of this is something like a coefficient of friction. What is a coefficient of friction by definition? Okay, so this is coefficient of friction. Okay, what that typically is defined as whenever we're thinking of it in terms of physics or that kind of thing, it is a tangential force over a normal force. All right, so for us, that is going to be equal to, all right, um, the tangential force we're talking about is just T over R. And what is my normal force? Okay, if we're talking about the loads that are being applied according to this picture right here, it's showing this W value right here as being the force 
applied. And so that's also the reaction that happens on the, um, you know, on the bushing part of it. Okay, so I'm going to put that in as W. All right, well, um, this is something that I can solve for T if I want. So T ends up being FWR. And what can I do with that? Right, so I can put that in and say FWR is equal to 4 pi squared R cubed L uh, times my viscosity times N all over C. Okay, and you might think that we are almost done, but not quite yet, okay? Because there's another big concept we need to bring into this that is important for these bearings. Um, and it's this, do you think that it will have an impact on the pressure uh, in the fluid if we change the dimensions of this bearing? So if we make this length longer, like this length down here, if we make that length longer, do you think that'll have an impact on the pressure in the bearing? Most likely it will. If you change the diameter of the bearing, that also has an impact on the pressure, the hydro, hydrodynamic pressures in the bearing. Okay, so what we're gonna do is um, define something that may not seem like it's very real, but it's, it actually is very useful. So let's say that we take uh, the bearing that we have in this case, I'm going to do like a little 3D view of it. Okay, so you have the, the journal that's like this, and then based on the bushing that's around it, I'm going to define a pressure on the projected area. So imagine there's like this little patch of area where the bushing is installed. And what I'm going to do is take that little projected area and imagine there being um, a, a pressure that's applied over that area such that that pressure is all just uniform and goes down like this. Okay. Now, do you think that's how the pressure is? Because what I'm basically indicating here is that there's some sort of a pressure that's applied uh, on this journal and it's just always downward so that there's not really a distribution of pressure. Do you think that's how the distribution actually is? Okay, probably not. The distribution of pressure is actually a good bit more complicated than that because it's going to depend on all the hydrodynamic uh, effects that are going on inside of the bearing. But this is a good starting point to at least have something that, that acknowledges the size of the bearing. Right? So that if you have a certain amount of load that's being applied, how much area generally over which, oh, oh, you know, is that distributed over, right? Maybe that's a better way to say it. How much area is that applied load distributed over? Okay. So what would the area of this little rectangle be for the example that I was doing here just a second ago? Okay. This would be two times R. And what would this over here be? L. L. Okay, and the amount of pressure that I'm talking about putting on here, let's use, give that the capital, capital letter P. Okay, so now that I have that, how does that relate to W? Okay. Yeah, pressure times area is equal to force. So we're basically saying the average pressure that I have within that uh, zone, the average pressure in that zone times the, uh, the area gives me force. So P times A is equal to that W that I have right there. And what is P times, what is, what is the A? L times 2R. Okay, so now I have this, F times uh, PL times 2R times R, 
is equal to 4 pi squared r cubed L uh, viscosity mu times N all over C. All right. And we can actually kind of condense that down. You see there's a bunch of variables in there that are in there more than one time. So when we condense this down, this tells us that our coefficient of friction is going to be equal to 2 pi squared times R over C times viscosity times speed over pressure. And this is Petroff's equation. All right, so Petroff's equation is a, is a pretty cool thing. Here's the main thing that pops out of Petroff's equation. It is these two dimensionless groups, okay, which are sometimes collected together and make, you know, a bigger dimensionless group. So the first one is this ratio between what? Okay, that's between the radius of the journal and the radial clearance that we have in the bearing, okay? So that's kind of an interesting thing. That's a dimensionless group. This is the other one that we, we have to kind of go back and remember what uh, viscosity even is. Uh, whenever you flip back a couple of pages, they talk about uh, viscosity. And, uh, you know, basically this group you know, you kind of think of this as being speed, which is, you know, revolutions per, you know, time. And um, P, which is in pressure, viscosity is in units, at least the type of viscosity that we use for these, it's in units that cancel those out and it makes this a dimensionless group. Okay. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. Uh, any questions about the derivation so far? Yeah. Ah, okay. So the question is, we assumed that the journal was going to maintain a position in the center, uh, you know, due to the, the support of the lubrication film. Is that basically the question? And why wouldn't it, you know, why wouldn't that center get off center as a result of there being a load applied? The answer is that is exactly what's wrong with Petroff's equation. Okay. That is what's wrong with it. It's that in real reality, um, the, the journal does not maintain uh, a center position within the bushing. Okay. If it did, the actual hydrodynamic effects that cause the support, they don't end up developing. Okay, and that's actually going to be what we look at um, when we meet here next time. But we'll just say for right now that when, when there is a, uh, an off-center off effect, basically the, the journal becomes off-center relative to the bushing, that creates um, an asymmetric amount of pressure in one side relative to the other, and that's what creates the support. So that's, you know, again, it's really astute, then that is the exact thing that's wrong with Petroff's equation, all right? But what's useful about Petroff's equation is that it introduces these two numbers that are helpful to us. Let me show you one application where this uh, viscosity times speed over pressure, where that's useful, okay? They have this little chart in there. Well, it turns out that if you track uh, the coefficient that you get, this is, this is from experiment. Okay, so if you set up experiments like this and you try to run bearings so that you vary this, uh, this characteristic number, viscosity times speed over pressure, um, what you see is that if you let the viscosity or the speed drop too low, what happens is the coefficient of friction starts going way up. Why do you think that is? Okay. 
okay? Yeah, what happens is there starts to actually be contact between the journal and the bushing. So whatever the, because no surface is perfectly smooth, so what happens is wherever those highest uh, ridges are within the surfaces that mate with each other, you start making it to where there is extremely little amount of, of uh, you know, even less than is normal, right? Extremely small amount of lubrication, as in maybe just a couple of molecules, right, between the two parts. Well, once that happens, then what happens is if that begins to, if that starts to happen, then your lubricant actually starts to gain temperature very quickly. Well, what happens when you gain temperature? It gets less viscous. Well, then what happens? Okay. By getting less viscous, that leads to a decreasing bearing characteristic. And then what happens? Okay. It's a bad cycle, right? So there is a cutoff value for this, uh, you know, viscosity times speed over P. And the book cites this value that this needs to be greater than or equal to 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, and that puts you up here where your film is stable and you're not having this, you know, these increases in temperature in case there's, uh, you know, this too thin of a film. What if you're up here in the thick film side? What do you think happens, let's say there's, there's all of a sudden an increase in temperature in your bearing. What's the, what's the next thing that happens? Well, you don't actually have parts that start touching each other as long as this film is thick enough, right? So if you increase the temperature, what happens is the, uh, vis by the viscosity getting smaller, it leads to less uh, friction in the bearing, right? That's one of the things that happens as you increase, or excuse me, decrease viscosity, is it actually decreases the amount of friction in the bearing. Well, then that decreases the amount of heat that's generated and it actually will cause there to be a decline in the temperature, right? So it's a stable system. That's where they call this unstable and this stable, right? As long as you have that film thick enough, it tends to stabilize. If the, th if the film is not thick enough, it becomes unstable and you end up, you know, the temperature gets um, out of control and it ends up breaking something. If the film is too thin, you stop having the layer of fluid in between the parts, which that gives rise to a very fast increase in temperature, right? And as that temperature increases, it actually causes there to be a reduction in the amount of viscosity, which causes the parts to get even closer together, meaning there's more and more contact and it destroys itself. All right. So let me actually show you something else that's, that's really nice. Remember, this was Petroff's equation up here. Um, I want to show you a preview of what we're going to do next time, which is the actual technique we will use to analyze and design the um, you know, hydrodynamic bearings that we're going to get into. And uh, it involves these charts. Okay. This chart right here represents how you would go about trying to figure out the coefficient of friction that would be associated with a hydrodynamic bearing, okay? And you actually see some things here that are pretty cool, right? Actually, let me go up here and copy Petroff's equation so that we get to see it relative to this chart. Okay. <clears throat> all right. First of all, what do you see right here? There's a group of variables called the coefficient of friction variable. That is a dimensionless group as well. How hard would it be for me to create the coefficient of friction variable in Petroff's equation? What if I multiply both sides of the equation by R over C? Is this what it would become? Yes. 
2 pi, whoop. Is that what it would become? Okay. Well, what do you see on the other axis of this chart? So if we're using Petroff's equation, then what would the shape be for the relationship on this chart? Okay, now this is kind of a tricky question because this is a log-log uh, chart. Let's pretend it's not. Let's say that this is, what if it's a linear-linear chart? If it's a linear-linear chart, what would the relationship be between, um, you know, the variable that I have over here and the variable that I have over here? It'd be linear, right? They would, because there's just a constant multiplied by, the, by them, right? This is just a constant that we would multiply. And so you'd have a linear relationship between these two dimensionless groups if you were using Petroff's equation. Now that's not how it actually works, okay? But what you're seeing with this chart it, this chart is based on uh, uh, probably a few different things, but they are, there are some relatively tricky uh, differential equations that you can run through and come up with theoretical uh, expressions for you know, how these things relate to one another. We're not going to get through all of that, but what I'm going to tell you is people have encapsulated the information out of those kinds of endeavors into charts like this, and we can use these charts. Okay, to relate the little dimensionless group that I have on the left to the dimensionless group that I have on the right. One of the things that you will see in the textbook um, is that there are a good number of these charts, but the cool thing about all the charts is they pretty much all have the group that's over here on the right as the uh, you know, horizontal axis. Okay? And there's a reason for that. That dimensionless group all put together is called the Sommerfeld number. Here down here it says it's the bearing characteristic number, but then it says it's capital S, right? So that is, this is usually referred to as the Sommerfeld number. And that's the number that we are going to use to, um, to look up a bunch of these different characteristics that we have for uh, these hydrodynamic bearings. All right. Any questions at this point? No? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's call it a day for today, and I will pick up and we'll do an example problem with these charts next time, and uh, you know, get to see how to deal with these hydrodynamic bearings.